tell you a little bit about what we're doing this evening. So this is uh, in response to the survey that we put out last year, asking what you would like to see workshops on. And one of the ones that a lot of people were interested in was impromptu exercises. And as you'll be aware, in the new Flexi Speaking and Performing Syllabus, we've got a lot of impromptu exercises. And so what's going to happen tonight is we've got Karen Austin, who is our Chair of Examinations, and also Lucinda Heslin Whiteman, who is also an examiner and recent addition to the Board of Speech New Zealand. And they are going to be taking you through the different impromptu tasks involved in Speech New Zealand exams. So Karen is going to work through those one by one. And then Lucinda, who is at the moment studying teaching drama at Waikato University, is going to share with us uh, some of the work they've been doing there on improvisation. Now, at the end of each section, Karen will invite any discussion or maybe ideas you have that have been helpful for teaching each of the impromptu disciplines. So she'll invite you then. And if you can keep your mics on the rest of the time, and then if you want to say something during those times, just unmute yourself and talk at that point. So... Um, if you've got any questions, if you can type them into the chat box, and again, we'll look at those at the end of each section, or if we do run out of time this evening, we will deal with those via email at a later date. So feel free to use the chat box there too. I'm just looking on mine to see either. Oh, yes, there's the chat. I'll just turn that on. All right. So... Karen, do you think you're ready to? Yes, yes I'll make a start. And um, Emma has kindly um, done the slides and she's going to be the slide operator in case she's anything happens, we have full faith in her. All right, so let me just get this started. Hopefully you can all see my screen. Now, wait a minute, um, that is, oh yeah, sorry. Yes. Can everyone see that? It says, yes, it says yes, impromptu yes, tasks? Yes. Fabulous. All right, go for it. Okay, so if you move on to the next one. So what we've, got, what we've done, this is how we've done it. And hopefully this is helpful to you and to us. So what we've got done one side is um, improvisation um, that are in the speech and drama syllabus. And so initial... It's got use mind, voice, and action to create a simple story, have a structure, including a way of starting and a way of ending. And you're quite capable of reading the others. And then in the flexi syllabus, um, that'll go further on, it, we've done it by grades as well. And so that just reminds you of what our examiners are looking for. And the way that I teach it, and the way that um, I talked with my sister, Sarah Madison, who's meant to be here, um, for many years in Omaru, and what we used to do was every week we had a theme. So for example, last week, I had the theme here, this here, H-A-I-R, and so everything I taught them in the lesson, it and that they did impromptu wise was related to here and so what happens is that the students who take time to think of their ideas and who haven't got the greatest confidence in expressing their ideas by the time they hear three or four children in the group give talks about the theme tell stories and then we get to the improvisation they have got lots of ideas they may not have had before. And it also means when you're teaching that you can teach these impromptu skills an easy way, really, and with structure. So with the five finger formula, we used to do this, and I still do it, um, with all the impromptu tasks. We had a five finger formula. And so we had it on a big chart and they had it in their exercise box. But then when they were doing it, we just go through at the beginning what they had to do. And so for the five finger formula for improvisation was think of your character, 
your names and the storyline. Two, um, an opening line to let us know who you are, where you are and what you're doing. Use actions and dialogue to move the story along. Use space and mind, build up tension to have a dramatic event before the ending. And this way, the others, who they've all got it, so they'll say, oh, you know, you forgot that. Or, so they're learning, they're learning through discovery, really, as you go. And it's, it's, I think it's a really good idea. And um, so for the teaching ideas I've got, it uses a theme for all impromptu activities in the lesson. And then quite often, particularly before exams, just so they um, realize the importance of the beginning, the middle and the end. What we do is one, one will do the beginning, one will do the middle and one will do the end. And then that way they get it in their heads that it has got to be structured. It's not just play way all the way. And they will correct um, one another. So that's proved actually really good. And for a lot of um, my children up here in Nelson, that is the highlight of their lesson, doing these improvisations and plays. You know, they come rushing in and say, what is the theme today? Emma, is there another um, slide about the Flexi Speaking Forming Syllabus? Or was it just the one? Sorry, I muted myself. That's that's it. That's the one for improvisation, oh, yeah. All yeah. oh, right. So that must have just been the lit. So I might have made a bit of a fluff up there, but that's okay. So now I'm going to sign off about improvisation and Lucinda's going to take over. Cool. Okay, Lucinda. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, improvisation, the art of acting without a script and being able to create spontaneously without preparation. So I think we can never underestimate the transferable skills and strategies this gives us and our students. So I'm going to explore the vital importance of prioritizing improvisation games and exercises as foundational tools within our teaching practice. So, Lucinda, can you move up a bit? Just we can just barely see your face. Oh, all your screen, I, maybe. I can't actually see myself. I can see you in the corner. I can't actually see. Is that better? Yeah, a bit better. Maybe if you just do your screen one way or the other, it might work. Sorry, move my screen. Yeah, just so we can see more of you. Yeah. Because I, I can't see. How do I? So I can see myself if I put participants. Would I tilt it forward? Denny says tilt it forward. I'm having trouble with the sound. Ooh. That's better. That's better. That's okay. No. I know. Still more. Things echoing. Sorry. Are you happy with where I've got the screen now? No, you just need to see a bit more of you. So could you tilt it forward a bit more? Is that? Yeah, that's good. That's good. That'll do. Good? That's Sorry, because I, I can only see you. I can't see anyone else. So I don't know how it's Thanks, Lucinda. Um, um, Jennifer said, click the small single square above the pictures or bottom right. If no pictures to see. So yeah. So if you hover over your hover, if you hover over where the little video is showing, Lucinda, there should be um, four different lines options. There should be a line and then a square and then two boxes and then nine boxes. Yeah. Oh, I don't know. Oh, I'm, okay. I'm on a. An iPad, I don't know if that comes up differently. Oh, that, oh no, no. That might be changing. That's fine. We can see you now, so we won't worry. Sorry. Mm. I just because I can't see um, myself back for some I can see you though, Karen. You look, that's the main thing. thing. That's so, main thing. and if you don't mind me really quickly jumping in, Melda, the reason you're having audio problems is that you've signed in on two devices. So I've got Melda, you've signed in on must be maybe your phone and your computer. So if you sign out on one of them, it's because there's two devices that are battling at the same time so that'll be why that the sound is funny okay please carry on Lucinda sorry about that so improvisation unlocks and builds so many vital fundamental interactive communication skills 
in a completely open, creative and spontaneous way, which is the key. So to fully and regularly engage in a wide variety of improvisations in the form of exercises, games and impromptu scenarios combines to create a powerful wide ranging combination of tools and school, skills, which is exactly what Karen has just taken us through. And these transfer seamlessly through to the more formal requirements, such as acting off script, writing formal and informal speeches, giving off the cuff presentations, and just any formal work or exam preparation. So I'm just going to go through the vital uh, improvisation rules, the ones that are key, but as I go through them, just envisage how these transfer across the board to all the skills that we're creating, how interchangeable they are and how much they enhance the curriculum. So firstly, to listen fully with every part of your being. Secondly, play in the present and use the moment. Thirdly, say yes and. Fourth, to connect with one another. Fifth, do not block. Be a positive conduit. Number six, be a contributor. Add new information. Number seven, avoid asking questions unless you're adding information. Number eight, establish location. Number nine, be specific and add colorful detail. And number 10, be willing to go with the flow and change. So I think those are absolutely vital because improvisation is both an art and a craft. So we learn it through practice, repetition, trial and error, teamwork, commitment, and shared goodwill. So by actively growing and refreshing our repertoire of improvisational exercises and techniques, this equips us to adjust accordingly to meet the specific needs of every class and student, which are ever evolving. So if we begin to build these when the students are juniors, and when I say build them, I mean more than just an occasional, let's do a bit of improvisation, building in the sense that Karen has said where it's a weekly thing that we do that's non-negotiable and that is part of the framework. Um, I found that it's really invaluable when you get to the point where the different classes actually start choosing the exercises or the games that are their favorites. They take ownership of them and then they start to actually evolve from there within the class um, and also they become great motivators and rewards. Um, so for example, um, a really simple little game that I made up, it was actually for a junior class and I specifically made it because it was what, that these were very young children, they were year one and two, so five and six year olds. And, um, some of them were a little bit reluctant. Some of them were incredibly spontaneous and happy to, to stand up. And one particular little boy couldn't bring himself to stand up, let alone to even say his name. Hi, my name is um, in front of a group. And um, so I created just this very simple little game. I brought along three random objects um, and I called it Space Jump. And basically, I, I, they all sat together in a line, so it was very equal, there was no pressure. I put out the three objects, and they, the rules were simple. They just had to get up, and they had to introduce them. Choice. Sorry, that's my watch. They had to introduce themselves and say their name, and then they had to pick one of the objects and hold it up and say, this it looks like a, whatever it was, and then do a little turn, which was the space jump, and then say, but it's actually a, and then they would act out whatever amazing thing that they had imagined it to be. And um, this it was just a very interesting progress because 
in the first, I didn't make him get up. It was voluntary. Like, I mean, they could all have a turn, but I wasn't saying to any of the reluctant ones, you need to get up now. And basically, it turned out to be an enormous amount of fun because, of course, they came up with fantastical ideas and acted them out and everyone was getting into it and just carried away in the, often the humour of the moment. Um, and I just remember in week three, this little fellow that would not get up at all just got up without a fuss lifted up the object he wanted and said hello my name is and he was away and in fact you couldn't hold him back after that so sorry what I'm trying to um, say is that some of these simplest improvisational exercises can build into something that's actually got incredible momentum and serves particular needs all along the way because I had thought this was just be, just be suitable for my juniors and some of the seniors who'd be waiting to come into the class after them asked what the game was. And so I said, oh, would you like to play? And that turned into an evolving um, sort of situation as well, because they became, um, they absolutely loved it. And they started to have themes, which fits in with what Karen's saying that, you know, you can work it around the curriculum or what you're particularly aiming towards, or even just what their interests are. And then we would, from what we did in Space Jump and whatever fantastical things these objects became, we might then have a separate improvisation based on that. And it would just build and build and build and build. And it was all interlinked and had started off with sort of such a, a fun, spontaneous um, basis that they sort of really owned it. And it got to the stage where they would be regularly requesting these certain games and um, you know, you you get to the stage you sort of have to balance um, other more perhaps formal things you need to do with these. But yes, so I just, the way that grew and the benefits it had that I couldn't have even predicted is another of the reasons that I'm just so um, dedicated to um, improvisation. Um, part of... Um, thinking up new games, thinking up new opportunities and ideas is to have some really great resources. So I'd highly recommend um, the Improv Encyclopedia. Um, you can go online, the um, address is there. Um, it's a, in a written form, so it's actually quite a large document. Um, and if we just go to the next slide, um, you can see the categories that are covered, which are really comprehensive. <laughs> That gives you a really good example. So oh. there's something for everyone and for every situation and some you would have never even dreamed up. Um, it's constantly being updated. There's a website as well. And what's really fantastic is when you go through the categories, it literally states um, nicely and succinctly what the purpose is, what the age group is, you know, what it's going to encourage and, and develop. So I just think that's an extraordinary resource to keep upping our own game, if you like, with, with fresh material. Um, another thing I think is really important, and I've been really focused on this myself this year, is um, as teachers ourselves, is that we make sure we put ourselves on the other side of these exercises and games, as appropriate, of course, um, so that Firstly, we're role modeling our own participation and again, as appropriate, but also we're role modeling, accepting the invitation to experience all the effects of improvisation and impromptu, the highlights, the lowlights, um, when it's successful, when it's not. And I think if we put ourselves sometimes in with having the experience of these exercises and games with the children, we actually um, can mould them by experiencing it ourselves in an even more appropriate way um, for the future. Um, so I'm currently myself um, doing um, a university theatre studies course and this involves three two hour lectures a week. And I was absolutely amazed that the first hour of these lectures is spent with improvisational warm-ups and exercises and games and um, that put me right back on the other side of being the student 
which I've actually found surprisingly invaluable in ways that I didn't expect. Um, it's been really eye-opening. Um, and one of the things that I've, I've found quite interesting in this journey is I thought an hour of doing this would be too much, would become overkill, et cetera, et cetera. Um, because of the wide variety of what we're given and um, the depth, obviously because, I mean, we're, we're adults, the depth to which it goes, it's actually been the opposite. It's um, it, The time just goes so quickly. And by the time you get to the second half, you're so completely set up, so completely internally and externally prepared for anything, so sort of open. Um, I just honestly can't say enough about how it's kind of reignited in me the importance of prioritizing this, you know, with our students. Um, say next. And in regards to the follow-up from this, so when we do the particular exercises and games and group activities, whatever it is that we're doing, when we finish it, like I've always encouraged attentive listening, you know, from your students as you do while these um, activities are going on and constructive feedback um, from classmates. But now I take that a step further, which is what happens in these lectures because the lecturer actually asks us specifically, what did we learn and how and why we learned it? And then feeds back to us about really what the basis of those exercises are and um, I've just found that that's added a whole new level as well. Whereas I might perhaps in the past have introduced, I mean, and obviously age appropriate here too, you know, the little ones perhaps not so much, but you know, you introduce um, a game or an exercise and you, and you do it and they might do it very well or it might have some hitches, ups and downs as these spontaneous situations do. But in fact, you get, I got, and I, I now realize they get even more out of it if you are specifically pinpointing to them what you are aiming for and asking for their feedback. Did they actually develop that? Did they realize that, you know, within whatever the exercise is? Um, so just really to wind up, the, I think the wider benefits um, from improvisation, which is just so huge, um, is that we learn to make decisions quickly. We learn to go with the flow. We learn how to keep calm and focused in fast moving emotional situations. We learn how to think, act and feel simultaneously. We learn how to fully engage and participate in the moment as it unfolds and to positively support others in their performances as a matter of course. And finally, and most importantly, to trust our instincts and act on them. So um, just um, finally, I'd like to just give you a little example of um, the spaghetti warm-up game. Um, and just um, when you're watching this, just note the active, enthusiastic, hands-on involvement of the teacher in here, and also the well, these are experienced students. So note the shared excitement, the unreserved commitment, and the highly positive energy which they all share within this improvisation. All right. So, so let me just pull that up for you, team. Thank you. Okay. It's this one. Oh. Building a smart marketing on that one. My team and I always drove lots of traffic to our site, but hardly anybody ever. Sorry, this. Can everyone is, can everyone see this video that I'm about to play? Can everyone hear it? Yeah. Sounds oh, a little you. muted. The sound is muted. Yes. Um. All right. Let me try it now. Wait for it. Wait for it. Okay. Very really easy. Uh, so you're going to come yeah. in one at a time. So Did everyone start to hear him talking then? Yes, I can. Great. Mm -hmm. 
It's Fantastic. All right, I'll play it now. It's three minutes. The circle, and you've got one word to say in this, and the word is... Spaghetti. Well done, spaghetti is the word. But I'm going to give you a word, I'm going to give you an emotion, I'm going to give you something to feel as you walk into the centre of the circle. So if I said to you, it's a, your emotion was sadness, so if it's a sad spaghetti, I want you to fill your body with sadness. And then I want you to walk to the centre of the circle and say the word, which is... Spaghetti. <laughs> <laughs> good, 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 good. So I'm going to give everyone a different emotion, so you're going to come into the centre of the circle all the way out. Uh, just take one big step back. Uh, let's have an excited spaghetti! Spaghetti! Yay! <laughs> now what's really important in this game is that when you're... So I want the emotion to carry all the way in and all the way off, okay? So you're excited all the way into the circle, and you're still excited until you get here into the wings, then you have a good <laughs> okay? So just keep, keep yourself, yeah, so keep it in the moment the whole time. Uh, let's have a disappointed spaghetti! Let's have an angry spaghetti! Oh, spaghetti! Right! Oh. Uh, let's have a confident spaghetti! Spaghetti. <laughs> let's have an in love spaghetti! Spaghetti. <laughs> <laughs> let's have a cool spaghetti, yeah. Spaghetti. <laughs> let's have a very, very happy spaghetti! Spaghetti! Yeah! Let's have a brave spaghetti! Spaghetti. <laughs> go on, go on, go on. Uh, let's have a very, very weak spaghetti. Spaghetti. <laughs> let's have a very bored spaghetti. Spaghetti. Yeah, what's really, really important is that we get to the centre of the circle! Spaghetti. Thank you. <laughs> and let's have a rock and roll spaghetti! Spaghetti! <laughs> oh, yeah! And we're going to do a group round now. We're all going to come in. We're all going to come in. So we're all going to have an excited spaghetti! Spaghetti! <laughs> Strange spaghetti. spaghetti. Let's have a moody spaghetti. Oh, spaghetti. Let's have a brave spaghetti. Spaghetti. And even braver than that, we're going to have a superhero spaghetti. Spaghetti. And now we're going to have a super villain spaghetti. Spaghetti. And then we'll have a very, very mysterious spaghetti. <laughs> and we're going to have a party spaghetti. Here we go. <laughs> good, good. And that is the spaghetti game, everybody. Yes. So I think I move on now, but before we move on to uh, the next point, oh no, sorry, is there something else that, oh no. no I think, I think that's it. it. That's right. Oh, so hold on, have, someone's raised their hand. Samantha's raised her hand. Yes, I was just going to ask if anyone's got some teaching tips or questions about improvisation. Um, one thing that, I find teaching in small groups is that sometimes the students can fall into a pattern of one person taking charge and coming up with the ideas and the others will tend to sit back and let them do that and therefore they're not learning as much. So it's often a good idea to make one person the director of the scene and have a different person each time and they're the person that decides which idea you're going to run with, who plays certain roles if, if they want to do things together so that's just one to make sure that they don't fall into a pattern of one person always having their idea mm. put forward the good idea any others have we got another tip or question no so we'll move on and we might have one later all righty Right, so now we move to role play skills staircase, what you've got. It's not actually all that clear to read at the moment. Mm. Um, so we've got what's in the speech and drama syllabus and what is in the public speaking syllabus. And I, I thought I'd actually done the fixy one, but 
it is in the flexi, I think three, four, and five, maybe. And so you've got those um, learning outcomes there. And then the five finger formula is setting characters, problem or conflict, vocabulary and movement and resolve conflict. We've got vocabulary there because quite often um, getting um, carried away with the dramatics of the situation. It's um, sometimes the language isn't always courteous. So they've got to be reminded that if you want to get anywhere in life, you've got to be diplomatic and you've got to watch the language you use and the tone you use. So, so it has got some form of reality. And I think there's teaching tips there too, were there or they not come out? Um, not on this one. Right, so I've got the teaching tip. I'll just read you out the teaching tips. Um, so I think uh, one thing that we do is that we repeat and swap roles. For example, last week when they were doing here and they would do, um, you know, if it was a pair, they would just do the hairdresser and the client. But if there were three, they'd do the hairdresser, the client, and an angry parent about what the child got um, done to their hair. And then you can bring in another person. And they'll quite often ask me if they can do it again and, you know, have another go at another character. Um, so again, the, you know, again, they've got that structure that's on a chart, but they've got the five finger one that they can just keep in their head and they've all got that. Um, so it, it, um, it flows. Going back to Helen's tip, and this is a bit with role play too, I think we've all got those students, um, particularly when they're younger, the ones who no matter what role you give them will end up being the dominant character in the scene. And um, it's, it's quite a hard thing to deal with, um, to keep their enthusiasm but to make sure that they don't dominate. Um, you know, they're the sort that will make a minor role into a major role at the expense of the others. So I think it's, it's really important that they have structure because quite often when you're examining, you'll find, you might say, oh, yes, no, I, I might get you to do this or this or this. And it seems that all students are clear about improvisations, but not all think they know what role plays are. Um, so that, I hope this helps and of course with the plexi syllabus um, the difference is makes it simpler in a way for the child's confidence is that the candidate or teacher they can choose which improvisation uh, which impromptu task they choose to do so with speech and drama public speaking you go in and they have you know, they might have three or four impromptu tasks they may get asked to do, one of them. But with the flexi, they actually um, choose what they want to do so they know that before they go in. Um, so that's just another point to think of. So has anyone um, got any teaching tips or questions about role plays? Just, uh, Karen, when you were talking about that dominant one, this is actually a really good opportunity with role play to get them to experience the opposite. So your dominant child has to be the one coming back to the library with the damaged library book, and the other one is going to take the role of the, the bossy librarian. Mm -hmm. so, so they actually get to do the opposite of what their personality yes. might be. Yes, that's, that's a good idea, actually. Any, anybody else? All right, we'll move on. So you had a video um, example. Oh, right. I forgot about that. So this is just a little video. You want to refund? Off a role play. I don't understand. What is unexpected? My child will have beautiful locks. Now she has pointy ends on the... I hear it. I, I didn't know you were... Can, it, can anybody else not hear it? Can everyone hear it? Yes. 
Okay. You can hear? But maybe make it a bit louder somehow. I can't make it any louder. I'm sorry. That's oh, why right. I say okay. no. I can a little bit on here. Yep. I've turned my. Hi, Mom. She there we go. Oh, no, we've seen it yet. That's got to speak to her. So that, the little girl in shorts, that was only her third lesson. So they're getting into it straight away. So now this is impromptu storytelling, um, which we, I noticed we've called it impromptu storytelling in the new Flex syllabus. Sometimes it's called improvised storytelling as well. So you've got, um, so there, there I've got Flexi and Speech and Drama, where it comes. And then with the five, finger formula for impromptu storytelling it's thinking whether you'll tell your story from the first or third person point of view characters and the storyline then beginning middle and end voices and sound effect gestures dramatic development before the ending and again they've got that in their box and there's a chart so a teaching idea is have a small group tell parts of the story together. Either you can decide who will go next by making a sign or the students can finish when they want. And quite often I say that I won't make the sign until the students use gesture and had a sound effect. So we'll just look at these three boys. Um, who are telling a story about museums and they'd already done a talk about museums. One day Larry Mannell was walking along the streets of Nelson to go to the Provincial Museum um, and when he went in there he heard that there was an exhibit about shoes from 1781 to 2021. Then he went to see that exhibit. He thought the exhibit was quite boring, so he decided he'd put his shoes in there. So uh, he put his shoes in there, he had really smelly feet and didn't wear socks. So he put his shoes in there, and his shoes suddenly, with all the other shoes, they all came to life and they were annoyed that they had such disrespect they will put on people's feet and people will go, oh, their shoes, smell of shoes. Um, and so they all came to life and then, um, and then, uh, then Larry Mammal decided that the shoes looked cool and so he wanted to put them all on. So, but when he tried to put on the first pair of shoes, they started making him run around town going crazy. He ran around town going crazy because they were biting his toes to manipulate how he walked for the whole time. So um, they got him to run around and he crashed into some shops and then he was, and then police came, but then the shoes went on to the police. There was, um, there was so many shoes that it, that, that everyone in town had shoes on their feet and they were walking around with sore toes and they were being dragged around and going and buying shoe polish and other shoe related items. 
but one time, uh, Larry Meadow got Larry Meadow's new shoes made him run to the beach, but that's where the shoes got even more out of control, and she and his face fell on a big boulder. He knocked himself out. The boulder rolled onto the sand and caused a big sandstorm. Cool. One day, Larry Meadow. Thank you, Emma. And um, so, did anyone have anything they wanted to say about role play? Stories. Oh, hmm? Storytelling. Yes. Yeah, so, oh no, storytelling. Sorry, we've done that. So nothing. So we'll go on to the next one, please, Emma. Yes. So running commentary, which is just at grade five in the public speaking, speech and drama, and flexi. Um, so it's just the one learning outcome. And so for the five finger um, formula for that, it stage the occasion, create the atmosphere, you know, mention weather, crowd, emotions, start commentary, be descriptive, something dramatic happens and conclude. You know, some people might have two dramatic things. And so quite often um, I have them being a TV announcer and, you know, it might be fire, might be a famous person visiting the area, a flood, or school events, the usual sport, sporting events, um, or a fashion parade, something like that, Christmas parade. And then sometimes we have two commentators working together. It's actually quite a skill, and students enjoy doing it. Has anyone got any ideas or tips for that, or questions? Could I just ask, as an examiner there, Karen, sometimes mm -hmm. when mine are doing this, they like to uh, question somebody in the audience, they interview somebody. Is uh, it okay for them to do that to the other one and imagine as part of the commentary that they're actually... Yeah, yeah I think that's fine. We all think of different things, you see, so that's probably quite a good idea. We all think of different things, you see, so that's probably quite a good idea to help with it. Anything else? I was just going to say uh, that it's quite good for them to know the difference between um, a being physically at a game and knowing that you're commenting on other things about the um, the sports people rather than just relaying what's going on the game and the difference between that and being on a radio where you can't see it, you've only got the voice and the description to be able to do it. So there's like two different types of commentary. Yes, yes, that's true. Wait, I'll have that. Right, so will um, anybody got anything else to say? So we'll with move. The oh, sorry, with the oh. commentary, um, can that be radio, television, and in person? Yes. Present? Yeah. Yes. You've got three elements. Yes. Okay. And, you could, and that's a good idea, Celia, to um, think that you're giving it to a blind person. So you've got to be hmm. um, really descriptive. There's another okay. application. Occasion I, another occasion I use where it's somebody visiting a friend uh, looking out of the window, the friend can't get out of bed and something happens. So you've got, it's a one-on-one -on -one really. It's, it's a, um, not a running commentary for a group like at a sports mm -hmm. event. Or mm -hmm. But the same things apply that you've got to match what you see and shape it and suit it to the fellow who can't get out of bed and see what's happening in the street. Yes, yeah. No, that, that's um, very true. Can we move on, please, Emma? Yep. So now we've got the impromptu talk. So we've got the staircase there where it's, um, you'll see it's flexi, public speaking and communication, and it is speech and drama, but I must bust that off. It, it's speech and drama, it comes later, but speech and drama, it's grade six, seven, and eight, I think. And then you've got professional speaking because um, professional speaking is interesting because often we get students and they just come in and do the certificate or the advanced certificate, and they haven't done these things all the way up. Whereas I haven't included any diplomas tonight because I think whatever um, you do, so as you do the diploma in, you've got all the other skills 
that you um, have learned along the way. So with the five finger formula for impromptu talk, uh, um, you have the hook, an attention grabbing opening, outline the main points, explain three main points, give examples, um, make eye contact, have an expressive voice and gesture, and then sum up the points and give a message. And um, for the teaching ideas, there's use a theme approach. It's quite often the first thing I do in the lesson the talks. And then you've got the hamburger, which you've all heard of. But to have that in their box and as a chart is really good. And they've got um, what's got to be done in each piece. And the conclusion, mine will, you know, if someone just does a message and no summary, someone will, another student will pull out, you haven't done the summary. Or what about the message? So it just it helps them all teach one another. Have I got a clip for that or not? Oh, yes, you do. Yep, yes, you've got so two. Yeah. So we'll go back, and that, this is the museum's thing again. Okay. Museums are great things because it can show you, tell you a lot about the past and um, give you information in your brain. And it's cool because if someone finds something that looks historic, they'll, like, take it to the museum, and they're like, Ooh, this isn't historic. It's just a bit of stuff that you find in the ground. Take it to your mouth. Um, but if someone finds something actually historic, then they're like, oh yes, good job. Here is $100. Um, and then they're like, put it in a case. And then like the museums have all these glass cases, stuff in. Then they have like a little panel there with like all the information on, that says all about it. And like, sometimes kids go on trips to museums and the teachers are like, wow, look at this. This is the gun that, um, uh, Floopy used when he, uh, shot himself. Um, <laughs> Floopy the Great, he was a great warrior. So you shall look at this gun and read all about it. But then, of course, the kids just look at the gun and they're like, Oh yeah, good man! Yeah. And they don't actually read the stuff because that's just what kids do. But when they get older, hopefully they actually read the thing because... Um... Because then they actually learn stuff. And I sometimes read the thing, but not always. So, because I'm a kid. And yeah. Um, but museums are cool because they preserve history and stuff, and you can learn from it. So, if you're, um, so now I've told you about why his, um, museums preserve history and why they're good, and why kids should actually read the stuff, then I hope that when you go to the museum, you read the stuff. Museums. And then there's one more. Museums are purely. There are two types of museums. There are art museums and there are history museums. There are probably other types of museums, but I don't know about those. So the first type of museum is an art museum where people have lots of art and it's put up on display for you to look at. And yeah, that's pretty much it. And a history museum is like, they have loads of old artifacts and things, which people have discovered. And if you find something old, then you can bring it there and it'll tell you, okay, this is real or this is fake. And we'll pay you this much. And we'll pay you this much for each of them if you let us have them. And yeah. So, history museums often have like lots of information about the objects, which is a good way to like, oh, so that's what people did and how it was made and stuff. Yeah, so. I think museums are pretty good. So, you should go there. Good boy, good.
We'll just move on now, Emma, to the next one. Um, so this is MIME, um, impromptu MIME skill staircase. So it's um, speech and drama, it's initial and grade one. And then in the flexi, it's grade one and grade two. And as we all know, MIME is one of the foundations of improvisation and acting. So it is important. And um, the five finger formula is beginning, have a beginning, use movement, facial expression, show objects, and then have an ending. Um, quite often at the beginning, um, I give them quite a detailed story sequence as a starter. I, I might say, um, you were at the you were at the beach building a sand castle, and then you walked over to get shells to decorate it, and then you cut your finger on a shell, and and go on like that, just to give them some ideas, and then or I might link a character with an activity, a witch making a spell in her cauldron, and. So then they can elaborate more and or I'll get them to play this game where they show their surroundings. They might walk through autumn leaves, walk through mud, just that sort of thing to give them an idea. They actually, um, they love the prepared mines, um, particularly in building on the mines. So I'll move on again, please Emma. Uh, the social speeches skills staircase. So we've um, what I've done. I've just done the five finger formulas for them all. So you can I won't read them all out. But there's one for announcements, one for introduce a speaker, and one for thank a speaker. So we'll just look at this girl called Annie, and she introduces a speaker and then she thanks the speaker. Oh, let me one second. Let's share my screen again. This is the trouble with um, Zoom sharing is I have to keep changing what screen I'm on. Okay, Annie, introducing. My speaker is Jazz Thornton and the audience is a full school assembly. Hey guys, thanks for coming in this afternoon. I know that we've just finished exams, but I've got some pretty special news. We have Jazz joining us today. Jazz has come all the way down from Auckland to speak to our school. She is a mental health advocate and she is, she's helped uh, make the Voices of Hope organisation alongside her co-founder Genevieve Mora. Voices of Hope is where kids, teens and adults can go online and they can share their story and they can see other people's stories through mental health and how they've come out of it and it's very inspiring. I personally looked on beforehand and you have done some amazing work. Jazz is going to be talking to us about her mental health journey and how she has been really embracing life and how she has found the tools, the tips, the tricks, and she's going to be sharing them with us today. Big round of applause. Oh, and then you want to just go straight to the thank you? Yes, yes, go straight to the thank you. Okay, Annie, now move on to your thank you speech when you're ready. On behalf of all my classmates and staff, I would like to say a big thank you. Thank you for, thank you for being vulnerable and sharing your journey with us. Thank you for inspiring us. Thank you for giving us kids the tools to help find help. We have vibe, we have doctors, and thank you for sharing your personal journey with us because it's honestly inspired me. And I think, I think we can all find a way to get through things as long as we're together and we keep in contact with each other, like you said. As a, th as a little thank you, um, the staff and some of my classmates and I have got a little gift for you outside of the pack foyer, just to show a little bit of our appreciation. 
Thank you so much for coming, Jez. Big round of applause. Okay, any now. And so then we'll just move on with some other slides with some features. So we'll move from those. Then there's a welcome. That just needs to be a bit clearer. Um, the welcome and the tribute or eulogy. And um, what I do with um, these social speeches is that I put the, the five finger formula, I put it on cards and I just have it with me. And then uh, for a start off, they just use that card because there's a lot of different social speeches to remember and then they get the hang of it. And um, you can also work in pairs with one student introduce a speaker, the other thank the speaker. Um, I actually still, if I'm out somewhere and have to introduce a speaker or thank a speaker, I still just mentally count that five finger formula off that I learned when I was a teenager. It's proved very handy. So um, that's all of those. But now, would any of you, it is 7.30, I think, but we're happy to take questions and further teaching tips for those of you who've got more minutes to stay on. So anyone got any teaching tips or questions? Karen, um, Marguerite here. When I teach the advanced certificate in professional speaking, often to adults, always migrants, and they have never in their lives done any speech and drama, so you're really starting from scratch. So the way in which I have helped them was giving some structure to the impromptu talk is by letting them bring to the exam or bring to the class a sheet of paper on which they have printed in large letters what, why, when, where, how, how much, and the word conclusion. So that when they have a few minutes to prepare their impromptu talk, and the talk in that syllabus is always about an aspect of professional speaking, Mm -hmm. So the examiner will ask them to talk about voice or gestures or dress or <laughs> nonverbal communication so that at least they have a structure. And when they see the word what, once they have the topic, just to note down a word or two and so on. And once you've divided the two or three minutes that they have to talk by that many prompts, it helps them a lot to, to get a structure and not to speak a sentence and then do not know what to say next. I think all I'd say to add to that, you said a sheet of paper, Marguerite. So I wouldn't ever let students have a sheet of paper because it's too big and obvious. But um, when I was practicing them, I would, you know, have a card. Because if, uh, because if this, nothing looks worse, um, you know, sometimes when you're examining and they have an impromptu activity and they're allowed two minutes to see their grades, well, you know, if they have a great um, clumsy no. bit of paper. Sorry, and sorry, that's, that's, I will never allow my students to hold either school <laughs> or a big sheet of paper. When they do their exam, there's a table on which their computer stands because my students all use PowerPoint. Mm. So they put this A4 sheet of paper down mm. on the table and they stand away from the table so that the examiner can see their whole body, which is what examiners want. Yes. And mm. then they simply glance down and you even have to teach these migrants the meaning of the word glance. Mm. They glance down just to see what they're going to talk about next. They certainly do not hold no, either a no. sheet of paper or a card. Mm. No, and that's how it should be. Thanks for that, Margaret. Anybody else? Must be somebody else. Any, um, while, while we're here, any questions about the Flexi syllabus?
I like it. <laughs> good, Jen. That's very good. I also liked it. How can we get to talk? Oh. Yes, if we can hear you. Oh, I was going to ask, what about the language? I noticed it's quite sort of informal, like cool and kids. And um, I, I guess we use these words now I think in the 21st century. It's not quite such a formal situation. I've usually told my children not to use cool because I was a little bit too colloquial. Yes, I think we're more accepting of colloquial language now. But I think as, as students get older, you know, more senior, we would expect them to use more formal language. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Anybody else? I've just got a yeah. quick question about the grade four Lexi prepared reading. It's a pretty specific question. Um, it's about a message. Yes. Yeah. What, what sort of material would you be looking at for that? Just well, you could look at anything. We put that a lot. You could look at anything. But then um, you would then have to say it was a message. So so say if it was, um, we'll just take a fiction book that we all know, Anne of Green Gables. Right. So you could say the message was, you know, the message in the passage is... Um, how difficult it was okay. for Anne to adjust to living with Matthew and Marilla. Right, okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, yeah. If you look at it as though, if it was for something like an assembly, then it could be a message in the reading about an issue that they're looking at at school, like bullying or friendship or giving something a go that you haven't tried before, okay. those sorts of things. Okay. And so it could be a kind of inspirational message within the reading. <clears throat> okay, no, that's great. Thank you. Anybody else? Karen, it's not a tip or a question. It's a commercial. Um, on the Speech New Zealand Facebook page, I have posted the speech given by Lucia Tui, the young student from Tawa College who won yesterday the Race Unity Speech Awards. And except for holding completely unnecessarily a little set of prompt cards, it's a, she's an absolute outstanding speaker, so she's worth watching. And then I've also posted an interview that she had on breakfast on TV One, um, explaining what she did and where she's come from and so on. So those two are worth watching. Oh, gosh. Thank you. Thank you, my friend. Any other questions or tips? I think just to remember that the flexi syllabus, a lot of this is new for all of us. There's things that haven't actually been examined yet in there in the impromptu syllabus. But if you do come across anything, just fire the question into head office. They'll get it to the right person to be answered because you can guarantee if it's a question you've got, there'll be a lot of other teachers who would be interested in that too. So feel free to just fire those questions into head office and they will be dealt with by the appropriate person. Thank you for that, Helen. I only got my um, hard copy of the syllabus yesterday, so I haven't been through it yet completely. So there's sure to be one or two things that may be a bit grey. So, um, Helen, I'll hand over to you. So, mm -hmm. All right. Well, listen, thank you, everybody, for being here. I hope that you've learned a little bit more about some of the skills that maybe you haven't taught in the past and hopefully if you do have any other questions again just send those through to head office and we'll get them to Karen or Lucinda to look at and just a reminder that our next workshop is in I believe August yeah. and that is going to be Pauline Prendergast who is going to be doing a workshop on poetry and the different things that we're looking for and poetry and ways to teach it. And then our final one for the year is Pauline Douglas, who's looking at teaching <coughs> English speakers of other languages. So those are something to look forward to and we look forward to your company again then. So thank you very much to Karen. Thank you to Lucinda. And of course, thank you to Emma for all that sterling work mm. um, and the tech thing, which we're all fairly dreadful at. So <laughs> thank you very much. Thank